Hey everybody, welcome into the podcast, and boy do we have a show that we're excited about getting into today. We've got a very special guest back on our program. He is the great Marlon Chopper Young, well-known actor. Uh, he's been featured in a lot of films, and he was best known for Rufus from Entourage. And if you've not seen that series, go check it out on HBO On Demand. You can find it. Um, Rufus was a great character. He was one of the reasons I've always told Marlon why I love that show was because of him. He kind of kind of wrapped it together. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that with him today. And um, we've got some other things that are, he's going to kind of reveal. We've got some interesting some interesting piloting um, uh, stories. Uh, his his life as a chopper pilot, um, a helicopter pilot. Uh, in, in, in the uh, afterworld of, of his military career, but he was a chopper pilot in the military. Uh, so, um, uh, Keith, man, what, what else can, can I say about how excited we are to have Marlon on our show today? I tell you what, you deliver on that promise, I'll give you half off. But if he wears his hat, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Right? I mean, okay. Dude yeah. is so cool, man. I mean, he's, he's the most, he is one of the well, most laid back people and, and, and interesting people to talk to and because he is really not that guy at all, the, the Rufus no. character, but he just did such, it was great. I love uh, that. <laughs> it yeah. just makes me laugh every time I go back and watch uh, it. So, uh, Marlon, Marlon's awesome and he's such a kind person to, to come on and spend his time with us. Uh, he's got some information that he's going to, uh, you know, some things that's happening in his world. Um, yep. He's got some exciting things coming down the pike, uh, so you got to have to look out for that. And you know, I think a net was a Netflix special he's got. Um, I think yeah, yeah. So uh, he's got he's he's got his hands in a lot of things. He's kind of like us. And uh, yeah, so just to your point, you know, very privileged to have him spend as much time with us as he did. He was very gracious with his time, and we had a good time just kind of hanging out and talking. Mean, Really didn't know where things were going to go, but no, they, and no, they went some very interesting places. They did, and I kind of expected that to happen because um, he is quite the conversationalist. Um, I enjoy talking to him. He's he's had a a, a wealth of life experiences. Yep, um, and uh, he likes to um, you know share share those with folks, and it's and it's he's he's a good storyteller, and um, I really enjoy having him on. So. Um, so what do you say? Do we uh, just let's, go ahead and uh, yeah, let's roll get it. rolling? So without further ado, here we roll. Good friend, once again, Mr. Marlon Chopper Young on the show today. Thanks for joining us, Marlon. And in in my best best South Carolina Low Country greeting voice. Hey, Bo. <laughs> hey, Bo. Yeah. Remember that? Good. Hey, everybody, yeah. you go home. That's the first. Hey, Bo. Been a while. Yeah. I'll I'll go home like every. You know, 10 years or what the heck it is. And I will, I will not have seen uh, Mandy or Stacy mm -hmm. or spoken to him in that time. And that's the first thing out of Stacy's mouth. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. God, and where does he get his hair from, man? Oh, man. Ted Nugent. It must be. That guy has <laughs> always had a full head of hair, man. I mean, it, he'll, he'll never, yeah. he will never be super full gray like I am. He's getting there though. He's getting there. He's he's, he's getting a little little gray on him, but uh, good dude, man. I always yeah. love those guys, man. Yeah, man. It's still rocker. It's still rocker long. And, and you know, tattoos yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Hey, well, he's a bike rider, man. He loves loves his bikes, and yeah. you know, he's a free spirit, man. I love that guy, man. He's uh, always uh, I always remember him from from way back, man. Way back. So, I yeah, I became friends. I became close friends with with Mandy in. Um, Seventh, seventh, eighth grade, mm -hmm. something like that, and and then 
uh, and Amanda and I still remained friends throughout high school and then we joined the army and then she started dating Stacy. And then when I come home and I'd hang out with Mandy, then so the three of us became I feel like this friends. needs a I feel I feel like we need a little is this where this is going? All right, never mind. All right. <laughs> but the thing when I was when I was in Little League football, that's where I met Stacy. So I met Stacy when I was like yeah. eleven. Yeah. But we, we weren't we we're close friends, you know. But, but we are. Yeah. yeah. My sister dated Stacy for a short amount of time. Yeah, sure did. Yeah, <laughs> he is. Are you hearing that at all, Marlon? The the sound bites. It? Okay, all right. <laughs> Keith is on. He the DJ is in the house, man. I the mean, DJ gonna, is in yeah, the house. Barry, you're gonna start talking about dating sis. You know, whatever. All right, just yeah, carry on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's been it's it's, it's been a while. We we had you on. I, I was looking back through our notes, man, and uh, gosh, it's time time flies. It's been um, I think it was note maybe late October, November of 2019 uh, when we had you on the podcast for the first time as a guest for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I think that those, those segments aired February of 2020. So we did them in sequences, you know, so it's been a while since we've had you on man. BC before COVID. Before COVID. I just think about how we did that and, you know, coming up on our hundredth podcast episode, we've got, what like over 250 video segments and Mm -hmm. what we like what we've learned along the way and holy cow like just some of the you know just some of the differences i guess right and how i think did we break those up into segments jay yeah there was about five or six segments yeah okay they're still out there man just uh send people right to our youtube channel marlon you know just hey go over here see these guys and Tell them, tell them why they're there to hit that subscribe button, will you? I will. I will. Uh, I'll, make, I'll make that my, my job. <laughs> oh, my now. God. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you, are you guys self-taught with the podcast thing? I mean, do, 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 is, there, is there an instruction uh, manual? Got to do Well. Is this how you put the podcast together, or do you just start it? I mean, how do you do that? Because I, 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 one, have no desire to do it. But two, I'm fascinated that so many people are doing it and doing it successfully. Yeah, I think we um, we spend a lot of time studying. I, I'm a I'm a fan of this in life, but you find someone that's that you respect and admire in that field, and you attach yourself to them and you learn. And I I, I way back would just send Jay these various pot. I mean, it could literally be like women's health or whatever i mean it just had mm. no but it would that wasn't the point it was like listening to how good or this little look look at how they're doing this particular aspect of it and uh i went to i went to belmont and studied audio in their school of music so yeah. so i i sort of had the understanding of how to push the buttons and make it all it sort of i'm you know. the one that had to to really learn um and keith's very patient with me in that but it was really, it's been for me at my age, like learning a second career. Um, and it couldn't have come at a better time, to be quite honest, with COVID because everybody's working from home. Well, Keith and I were already established as podcasters. So when the shutdown came, it gave us the opportunity to really kind of dig our heels in right. and hone our craft. Right. And um, we have uh, been noticed and have been able to we we were we had some folks reach out to us and ask if we would help them develop their podcast and get them rolling and and so we did that that was about a three-month project for us and those guys are into their um what eighth or ninth podcast now and they're doing it all on their own and it's really good it's an automotive engine rebuilding and machinist podcast so it's a real high technical highly technical uh, it's, it's nuts uh, and bolts. Very, yeah. very, yeah. yeah, very skilled uh, guys. So that was fun to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was a, it was a mutual friend uh, that Keith and I had from where we worked before that you know remembered us and saw that we were podcasting and reached out to us and said, "Hey, man, can can you help us?" And so had some benefits in the long run to help us help somebody else get rolling. And um, we learned when we were teaching them how to do it. We were learning still ourselves. 
Um, right. We were learning from from the experiences of teaching them, so um, that was a very useful um, uh, 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 work uh, uh, load that we had for a three month period. I guess it was, but we yeah. were we were podcasting, helping them podcast. We were shooting videos. We were doing a lot of different things, man. So, um, man. but yeah, we're getting we're yeah. getting better. Like doing, yeah, yeah, it's great. It's, 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 I'm uh, I'm fascinated by people who can do something that I either either one have no interest in doing or two just can't understand. Yeah, right. right. I, I, that that fascinates me too. Just it's, and it, it helps what I do. You know, when you're playing a character, it's like, well, I don't in my own personal life, I don't know how to do that, but I'm totally interested in that guy. Yeah, knows how to rebuild a radio. Right. You know. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I don't listen to that all day. Right. It's like, I, I want to know the intricacies of that. Speaking of characters, yeah. and, and I don't think this was one of the things that we had on the list, but I'll just ask you this because this is going to, you know, okay, fans, for you listeners out there, this is where this is going to go today. We're going to be coming up with some stuff, so just pay attention to this, okay? So um, when, you, when you get into character, um, I know that you have to be in a special place, but is there was there one character that really kind of stands out to you that was like really difficult to 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 get out of after you were in that character? I mean, does that happen to you? Uh, no, it does not. Um, that's a that's a very specific method thing. Is it's so there are. Uh, Several there were several techniques of of, of that are taught to, on acting, right? Uh, but they all stem from this one core uh, acting technique. Uh, there was a guy named Konstantin Stanislavski who who came up with this this system of teaching actors how to make this thing organic, how to organically go into your own uh, psyche and emotional, you know. Uh, state and figure out how to make uh, a character more relatable and more organic than to pretend to do mm. right and then so he taught at the other you know, this in moscow and he had this he created the moscow art theater and he had a lot of actors in that theater and when he uh dismantled the theater a lot of those actors decided to go on and teach mm. right so they took their uh, their understanding of what they learned, and and that's what they taught. So you had these different these different techniques, right? So you had people like Uta Hagen who came out of the class, and she taught her understanding of the technique, and uh, Michael Chekhov who went and taught his understanding, right? And Sanford Meisner who went and taught his thing. Uh, and they and all had some of them named them different names, but they're, the, the, they all come from this system, right? So um, Sandy Meisner named his the method. So when you hear people talk about method actors, they're generally talking about people who studied either under Sandy Meisner or people who learned under Sandy Meisner, and now they're teaching. Okay. Right. So the method isn't a cross the board thing, right? So a method actor specifically, you know, learns that technique. Right, the, the Sandy Meisner technique, and that technique, uh, for for better or worse, seemingly so, a lot of actors find it hard to come out of a character that you went into depth in, you know, and and, and it takes some time to wind. Yeah, I I studied the uh, Chekhov, uh, Michael Chekhov technique. That's a little different. It's still, again, it's from the, it's from the Stanislavski it's basis. But I, uh, a lot of people never, a lot of people didn't teach Chekhov, and I found a teacher who taught Chekhov. So that one uh, is, you, I found an easier way to come out of character, right? When I, when you have to go into these characters. Now that said, I haven't had to do that much uh, in the last few years because. In the early years, I did plays, right? You do a lot of plays. Mm -hmm. So you get on stage. And, and so doing plays is so you can get to choose different character, difficult characters that you would never be be cast in TV or film. Like 
I could play Hamlet on stage, right? And the audience would buy a black guy that nobody knows playing Hamlet because he's a good actor. But when you get to Hollywood, they're like, well, Hamlet was a white guy, and we're playing to a white audience, and it's predominantly white, and you play, you know what I mean? Yep. So I don't get that. I get the, uh, I get the stern principal, <laughs> you know, right. right? Or I get the police chief, you know, or, or the, the, you know, the, the attorney with a chip on his shoulder kind of right. thing, right? Which I'm, I'm fine with. But that's so when I get called now, when I get called now, that's what I get called. They know what I do. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like, oh no, we need him for this. Like I just did a role two weeks ago that I'm, I'll be doing again. It's a recurring role on a new show. Uh, or this actually show that's been on Netflix. And I got called and offered them, right? It was an offer because I'd worked with this creator before and she remembers what I do. So it's like, we need this guy. We need a principal who's like this. I know the guy who can do that. Marlon Young, call him, offer it to him. And nice. that's how that happened, right? That's great, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so, uh, I, so the answer, to further answer your question, the, the, the only time I've had those two things happen, those, the, the confluence of those things, where I played a difficult character that I had to audition for, that I had to get into character, you know, that kind of studying to do it, uh, that took a little bit to get out of, not, not a lot, but just to, it took a day to just, a day or two just to settle down. Is a character I did in this, it, it's a, it's a, um, it's an independent film uh, called Blue Hill Avenue. And uh, I played a pimp. Who ended up that's, that's, to kill. Did you have the full? I mean, did you have the hat? And I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll find you have to. You got to send us that, man. We, we, I'd love to see that. Yeah, it was, it was, it was great. So I, uh, so I, so a buddy, of mine, oddly enough, he he just texted me uh, about this film that I'm talking about. Uh, he was writing this film. He's, a, he's an independent filmmaker. He was writing this movie. He said, "I'm writing a role for you, in my next movie." And he said, it's a, it's a role of a pimp. And I was like, oh, man, a pimp is a stereotype. A black guy's a pimp and a thing, and I don't want to do that. And, you know what I mean? He goes, oh, I promise you're going to love this. So he wrote it, and you know, and I, and I read it, and I, and, uh, I loved the character, right? Uh, because there's a way you can... I like playing against type sometimes, mm. right? It's like, well, this character, this, this, the stereotype of a pimp is this, right? right? So I put a little bit of that in it. But then add a little bit of other thing that you won't, you will, you know, you were like, oh, I didn't know that was, that guy's a real guy. He's not just a stereotype of, a, you know, this right. thing, this character, this caricature. So I studied Morgan Freeman, did a movie with Christopher Reed called Street Smart. Mm -hmm. And he was nominated for an Oscar for playing a pimp. So I studied what he did, right? And that took me into this. You know <laughs> this mental and emotional spiral because this pimp in our film has to he owes a big favor to a guy who's got something on him and that guy is having problems with this pimp's son so he he dictates that this pimp has to kill his son you know <laughs> so i so how do you get that place? You know what I mean? That's not just a casual conversation. So it, that took a while to get into, and it took a couple of days to, you know, to, to, to calm down. I'll have, I'll have you know? to check that out. Jay, man. you yes. ready for the pimp's name? Go for it. Twinkie. <laughs> Somebody's Googling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's Keith, the Googler over there, man. You got it. <laughs> You gotta, you gotta watch him. He'll, he'll pull something out of the closet here in a minute. You better All be right, careful. So I gotta, you, and you, you, you alluded to this a little bit, Marlon. We were talking about this a few weeks back when we were, we were talking about doing this. Um, and, and I'm, I'm just dying to hear from a professional's uh, perspective that's in the industry. We have seen uh, the world has changed in the past twelve months. Um, Hollywood is, is the movie industry, the entertainment industry is, is, is not immune and we're seeing things. And one of the things we mentioned was all these tentpole movies getting pushed back. 
yeah. uh, because they're worried about recouping the massive budget th- 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 that they have bankrolled to make these movies. Now, you just mentioned Netflix uh, and streaming services, I think, are probably benefiting from this in, in, in the sense that, sure. you know, they're they're picking up subs and it, it's kind of perfect timing for them. But what do you what do you think? What does this look like in a year? Uh, so are we are we back to twelve months from now? Are we back to doing these big, huge blockbuster movies? Is everything going to shift to a reduced budget, like we would see on an Amazon or a Netflix or a Disney Plus or you know something like that? Yeah. I mean, wh- 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 is it? I, I guess you know the term that we've all heard probably too much in the past 12 months is back to normal. I mean, does that happen or is it going to be different? I, I, I think, I think it's going to be, di- look, man, you give somebody a, a, a new way to do this thing that they've gotten used to doing. And said, this, here's a new, easier way for you to do it. And in this case, it's a less expensive, seemingly less expensive way to do it. Why would they not do it? Right? So, I don't have to go to the theater and spend, you know, a hundred bucks for me and my mm-hmm. two kids to watch, you know, Godzilla versus King Kong or whatever the heck it is, right? And I, so I don't have to, you know, pack everybody in the car, and, you know, pay for parking, gas to get there. Each ticket is, I don't know, 15, 20 bucks or whatever Minimum. Is. Yep. Popcorn and candy, seat, you know, all of that stuff, right? You just leave it in your kitchen, get you, get you a nice big screen TV, how big that is, you know, 55 inch or whatever the heck it is, right? Get Hulu Plus or, you know, Paramount Now or Amazon, you know, Netflix, or any of those streaming services, gather the family in the, in the living room and just play it. And you got, you know, and pause it when you, you know, when somebody has to go to the bathroom. You know what right. I mean? So I, I think because of, because this is, entertainment has had to shift to that because people aren't less entertained. Yeah. They still want to be entertained. Right, it's the it's the services that have to change, and they've changed. You know, I mean, Netflix has won the most Oscars. This, Did, you know, does that bother yeah, you as an I, artist? I mean, so we just finished talking about you doing plays and uh, the craft. You've got a guitar sitting behind you. You know, which by the way, that's a right. that's a Fender, by the way, of yeah. some sort. Right, and so that's that's a Bernie, that's Bernie Ball. Oh, okay. Oh, that's, it is. Yeah, yeah. Base. There's oh nice. okay sorry oh yeah okay well I can blame bad eyesight there's only four pins instead of six sorry yeah. I, I can see it now I've been threatening, I'm threatening to learn to play that for hundred years um, <laughs> there is a there is a um, there's an artistic aspect to if if does it bother you at all that I may not be able to take in your work like I could in a theater because the phone's ringing or, you know, the dog's barking or uh, three kids are running through the, the, you know, living room. Right, 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 right. I mean. No, no, that doesn't bother me at all. It, it doesn't bother me as, a, as, as, a, as an actor, right? If I, if I were a producer or, or a director, it'd bother me because I'm like, if you're not paying attention to it and getting the full entertainment value out of it, then you're not telling your friends to see it. Right. <laughs> so I'm not going to recoup the money that I put right. into it. You know? Yeah. But as a writer, I just, no, I just, I just do it and I, you know, hopefully do a compelling job. And when I am on screen, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll sit down and watch it. You know what right. I mean? That's all we have. Well, for me anyway, that's all I have as an actor is to, is to give this, give this particular performance. And hopefully it's compelling enough where you go, man, I really like you know, what that guy did. Or that reminds me of me because that's what that's what I think art is, is art holds up a mirror to, you know, the viewing audience and says, look at you. There's some aspect of you. In yeah. It. You know, so you identify with the character. Yeah. And it's it's interesting for, you know, you've been all over the, the place in, in regards to your your craft. And, and when I say that, I'm talking, I mean, you're not only lim- you're not limiting yourself to just film. Or you know, or right. shows. I mean, you as recently, and I was so happy to see it because of COVID. You know, you worry about your friends, and you know, is he going to have work? And you show up on a commercial. You know, I mean, I, I the Audi, um, the neighbors uh, commercial that ran yeah, yeah. Um, back over the holidays, which was a really really good yeah. commercial. Um, <laughs> I, I saw it. No, I saw it. And I'm like, ah, 
All right, he's doing he's doing all right, man. You know. In in in, in for your, to further your point, Keith, is the everything in the entertainment industry had to change, right? Because it's, you can't get on set, you can't be around people, you can't be directed by, you know, uh, as, like you were, you know. So how do you how do you make it work, right? And not not just after you get on set, if you know you. I, I'm an actor that still has to audition at times, right? So that requires getting in my car, driving to the studio, right? You know, going past the gate, getting in, going to the office, getting in the waiting room with everybody, going in a room with the casting director and the producers and the writers and doing all, can't do any of that. So we had to change and they had to change it pretty quickly because people had still written stuff, excuse me, uh, the studios have, you know, they they paid for this. They paid this writer to write this TV show. We got to cast it. We got to shoot it, right? It's going to waste of money. So, so the last bit is got to hire the actors. So, how do you audition the actors if you can't have the actors in the room, which has generally been it, right, for the last however many years, right? You got to get in the room. So they had to quickly figure out a platform with which to do that, and that, you know, so it was Zoom and it was Skype and it was, you know versions of that as the year went on. So I worked last year auditioning from my bedroom. Now, is it, can you set up a Sony cam and hit record and, and go, you know, like Jay and I do some stuff where we'll, we call them like, these are segments, right? So we're, we kind of, re, you're recording these in a, in, a, in a Zoom session or whatever. Then we'll go out and we'll do stuff in the field and it's, on a very, very, very small scale, o- only in the sense that it's pre-recorded, similar to that kind of work that you're talking about that you do. Can you do that in an audition? Like, could you just set up a camera and record it and then send them the video, or do they make you do it like like this, like in a r- real conversation? Both. Okay. Uh, the Sometimes you have to, for commercials, specific, I apologize if you can hear the we noise can't. out, Mike. No, we're good. Okay. Uh, commercials are always two. <laughs> commercials are always two, or always two auditions, uh, unless you're a spokesperson, right? Unless you're like the State Farm person, right? It's always two auditions, always, right? So you go in, you put yourself on this thing, you record yourself. So I'm in the bedroom on, and I'm doing it on my laptop. So I put the laptop on the bed because it's high enough. I put a light in there. That's it. Uh, you know, push record, do the thing that they want me to do, you then you're gonna send it in. And then you get a call, and that's the call back that you probably heard, right? So you get the call back, and the call back is now like this. Now it's you and doing the exact same thing you did in the bedroom by yourself, by the way. But now it's you doing it for whoever's on the other side of the Zoom. Mm-hmm. So it's the casting director, the director, the, the, uh, the, the um, production company, the ad agency, and the client, right? So it's all of those people. So it's the McDonald's people, the ad agency that's representing McDonald's, the production company is gonna shoot it for the ad agency for McDonald's and the, you know, the casting director and the director that they hired. So it's like that, nah, it's like nine people on the other side of the Zoom, right? And you do this and you know you do it and you go, okay, that was good, thanks a lot. And then you're off the Zoom. And then you either get a call from your agent or you don't, you know? Wow. Uh, well, at least it's at least fun. it's working though. I mean, it's, it's obviously yeah, it's yeah, working, yes. you know? and. Perfect. Right. It's perfect. It's perfect that we're selling the house and moving to Italy. That's outstanding, man. And y- you can I, work this way. There you go. Exactly. So I don't have to go be here to go. That's what it's proven, yeah. right? You don't have to be in the room. So I can do this in, you know, in Tuscany. That's awesome. And if I get it, you're on a plane, fly back, you know, do it. And then, you know, and fly I haven't been home. to Italy in a while. I'll have to look you up, man. <laughs> well, it's my wife has insisted on getting a house that's big enough so that when a bunch of people come to stay, they've got a place. Well, that's... I've got a place. Yeah. To, that's I just the, want to uh, go on a bread and cheese tour, man. That's what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I, I've i been once a long time ago. I mean, it was 30, 30 plus years yeah. ago. Uh, but my wife would... She was in the fashion industry, so she was back and forth in Milan a lot and, you know, traveling and around. Yeah. So she's familiar with it. But, uh, you know, but we've got friends who've been there and they love it. And it's, you know, so you got to go and the food is blah, 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 and a thing. And then we're watching the, the Stanley Tucci 
Finally, Italy shows on Sunday night on CNN when I'm falling in love with it again. I'm like, okay, we got to go. Right. You know, uh, so we put the house on the market next week. Fantastic. And then uh, when Italy opens up, because they're on, you know, they're on lockdown right yeah. now, right? Yeah. They kind of have, they kind of have the same mentality as a lot of the people here. Right. Is I cringing on my freedom, and I don't want to wear the mask, and I don't. Blah, 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 blah. I said, just wear the mask, so we can get back to right doing some. That <laughs> this is my <laughs> life motto, Marlon. Is I just try to not get yelled at. Like that's literally my motivation. <laughs> Whatever your whatever your beliefs are, and and I know like we all probably we, we probably have similar thoughts on that on things, but there are people out there that see things differently. I, I just try to just like not be the guy getting attention in in, in at the grocery store or uh, it you know as a little league coach like having some parent upset at me. Like literally, that's my goal is I'm just gonna put the mask on so nobody screams at me. I, I, you know, I just, <laughs> I got it. Well, well, we were talking you. before we went on the air about kind of the office drama and how you can kind of remove that drama with the modern kind of work from home uh, scenario. You don't have to deal with a lot of the like bizarreness. And, and it's, it's the same. It's like, I just, I just don't, I have, I just want to avoid any drama. I just want, you know. I just want to go on a, on a wine and cheese tour, right? And enjoy my cheese. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's it. No chin warmer for me, man. Yeah. Um, no, that's a good thing, though, man. That's a, that's a, that's, I think that's a really good philosophy. As, as, as comical as it sounds, it's a really good philosophy. And it's, it's not unlike my own things. I don't want to, you know what I mean? It's like I, I'm, I'm not rolling down my window and yelling at the guy who just cut me off. I, 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 I've done that before. I, I, I used to be that guy, right? He just got out. You know, I'm teacher, you, the, you know, you got to be aggressive, and then you do the fighter pilot thing. So you come out with this whole braggadocio thing. So when people do it, you go and get out of the car and go, "You know who I am? I can't believe it!" You know, but that, but that's I had to double down on getting rid of that part of my, you know, personality, if you will, right? Because it can be into. It can be misinterpreted by someone else, right? You're aggressive, or you're you're, you're too whatever. You know what I mean? So I'm along the lines of, to circle back with what you said. Along the lines of I just don't want to get into it with anybody, man. You know? So I'm just so the guy cuts me off. Now I'm like I slow down and go, go ahead, man. Right. <laughs> you you get there three seconds before I do. So yeah. Go right ahead. Yeah. You know, I do the same thing. I had to learn how to do that too because my wife gets on to me if I'm driving and I get, go through one of those moments. And um, yeah. so I've learned not to not to go there. But the joy that I get out of it now is when I say just go ahead, like you said, and then you yeah, get yeah. to the next traffic light and there are three cars behind you because they're <laughs> because somebody else cut them off and they got into this little, you know, it's a tit for tat kind of a thing, you know. So yeah, yeah, it's kind yeah. of interesting to see it all kind of like fall apart for them. That's the joy I yeah. get, you know. That's always <laughs> that's the yes. best. That's the best. About in, in any situation with it now, right? It, it, it's and it takes it, with just watching people do their thing. You know, someone cuts in line at a Starbucks, or you know, or whatever it is, right? Or they're just the, like my wife has people talking too loud in her vicinity. Mm. It drives her up the wall, right? And I just I say this. This is my 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 mantra is. I, when that stuff is going on, I just go to Tahiti in my brain. Yeah. Right? Just go, oh, well, there's no reason for me to say to you, hey, man, you're on a speaker, you're inside, we can all, hear, we don't want to hear your conversation. Can you keep it down? Because I know their response is, isn't going to be what I've imagined oh, no. their response is. Right? Yeah. So I just go, I'm just going to go someplace else. You know, and just tune that out until I get to the front. Because it'll be gone. In the next three, four minutes, I will never have to see that person again. Right. But if I engage them in this adversarial way, this isn't going to be good for me. Right. right? And it doesn't care that I have to carry that angst around for the rest of the day. Right. So I don't want to carry it right. around. I don't want to give you free space in my head. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so I just 
shut my mouth. And say, you win. You win. Exactly. <laughs> That's the goal. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you still fly much? I don't, I don't fly at all. No? Like, no, like I, you don't I, pilot I, I, or you refuse to get on no. air, aircraft? Pilot. I, I don't pilot. pilot. Okay. Yeah, that was the question. Yeah, thanks for clarification on that there, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Keith. Thank you. I'm just... <laughs> and, and I have a specific reason okay, why I asked that. point goes to the moderator for... Okay, sorry, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You can tell we've been doing this a while, Marlon, right? So, but yeah, yeah. I, I, so you don't. Um, so we, we, we did a couple of stories because it just kept kind of popping up and I just kind of was interested in knowing, you oh, know, I know where you're going. Yeah, your, okay. your take on this. So LA uh, had reported, you know, LAX had reported several occasions. Of course, pilots have reported this, this guy at 3,000 feet in a, on a jet, in a jet pack. They're calling him Jetpack Man. Have you heard about that? Oh, yeah. like, oh, like, this is like we're we're like scratching our heads how it could happen because and you know it's it's a so jetpack and to be at that altitude anyway. Multiple pilot sightings radioed in around the same time to air traffic control, I believe at LAX, right, Shay? Yes, it it was yes, and it's commercial airline pilots going, hey, I think we just saw a guy at a jetpack and they're at you know thirty five hundred feet or whatever. And then they get another one uh, within, like, what, like a couple, three minutes, something like yeah. that. So it's yeah. a different airline, same scenario. And then this happens repeatedly, like, over the course of, what, five, six months? And the guy, I and, think so, yeah. And there's and now it's quiet. It's crickets on the whole subject, so I don't know if anything had ever come out of it. And that was why I was wondering if you had heard anything of it or, or, or had seen any odd things in your flying career that you might want to discuss. <laughs> uh, well... I, I haven't seen that, uh, but I've had usually the uh, I, when you ask that question of pilots, right, who've been flying for some time, the it's not that they've seen something interesting. Interesting, it is that let me tell you about the six close calls oh. I had where I thought I was going to yeah. die. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I've had those. I've had. Yeah. Uh, I, I've had a. Um, I had an engine quit on me three times, three separate times, uh, midair, and those was a little scary. Uh, but uh, I'll, I had a, there was a, I was flying uh, off the coast of uh, where LAX is, right? Because LAX is on the mm -hmm. right on the coast, right, right over the ocean, so you can fly up and down that beach, you know, but obviously through air traffic control and all that. And I was flying through there once, and it was—it had—it was, it had, it was uh, the um, morning marine layer mm -hmm. was in, so it was really, really foggy. And there was air traffic control said there was a there was a helicopter coming in the opposite direction. They have them on radar, but they don't have them on radio, mm. so they don't know—they're not sure exactly where he is. That was scary because. He could be coming right at right. me, and I, you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Well, that's that, that was that was the scariest I I've been for for the longest because I had to creep through the fog, not knowing where this other person was, kind of thing. Right. You know what I mean, eventually I passed him, I guess, and I, you know, I, but that was that was really scary. Uh, I was flying into Burbank one night, and I I I flew for this new station. So we, the, the air traffic control people knew who I was uh, because I, you know, I flew pretty frequently. And I was coming in at about a thousand feet uh, going north. And uh, the guy, I, and I just called in, I just entered their airspace and said, hey, I'm coming into Burbank at a thousand feet. And somebody said, Marlon, is that you? And I said, yeah. And he said, you, can you start a climb because there's somebody coming fast and without lights on from the east, and we're not sure how high he is. Mm. But we think he's about a thousand feet. So I said, okay. So I start, so I look east, I don't see anybody. I start my climb, right? And I get to about 1,100 feet, 
and I see the shadow of a helicopter go right under me. Holy cow, man. Yeah, right? So that makes you butt. Right. Oh. oh, I can imagine. <laughs> and uh, the third and scariest one, uh, I'll give you, and then I'll, you know, I don't want to belabor this. You know, <laughs> this is interesting, though, man. Very scary helicopter stuff. But I was flying for a company. I flew for a couple of different companies. Helicopter, helicopter companies, sometimes, if they're a startup company, it takes a while for them to start gaining capital because it takes so much capital to, you know, to maintain them because, you know, hour of flying and an hour of mechanics, an hour of flying because everything, you know, vibrates. This so explains why vibrate. TC was always working on his chopper in Magnum PI. <laughs> yes, that's it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. exactly, exactly, right? So I, uh, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I got called TC when I was flying tours in Hawaii. I guess I don't have to tell you how many times I got called TC while I was flying tours in Hawaii. It's like everybody who got on the thing, hey, it's TC, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's awesome. I don't know why. So, uh, flying for a company, get chartered to go pick up some executives uh, down uh, south, El Segundo, which is just south of, of LA, LAX, right? So, I fly in, pick them up, and they happen to be executives for uh, Exxon. And they're going to go out and inspect these. There are four, if you drive to Santa Barbara, if you fly, but if you drive to Santa Barbara, uh, when you get past this town, there's a town before you get to Santa Barbara called uh, Carpinteria. And you look to, the, look to the left in the ocean and about a, about a mile out, there are four oil derricks right next to each other. It's big oil derricks. And these guys, I guess they, they belong to them. They were going to go out to inspect them. So I was to fly them out to, to inspect them. And I got the helicopter. It's got pontoons on it and the whole thing, right? So it's whatever time it is. And I'd say to them, and I, I say to them, listen, we don't have all day to be out. We only have a couple because the marine, the marine layer is going to come in and it's going to, you know, it's going to fog in these oil derricks and we are not going to be able to get to the next derrick to inspect it. And we're not going to be able to be able to see it. So I'm going to have to you know, fly above the clouds so we can see it. Uh, executives, not necessarily people, most, most people are, are, are excited to get on a helicopter. Right. right? But like, you're in charge, you're a pilot, this is what you do, man, this is cool. To executives, you're a cab driver. Right. Because they do this all the time, right? So then here's my jacket, here's my here's my briefcase, just go sit up there and drive and do what you do. We're going to be making money back here, so <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so I said that to them, and I, I, I said, so we have about 45 minutes to do, I don't know how many derricks you want to do, but we have about 45 minutes, which means we only have about 10 minutes on each one of these things, and then we have to fly out of there. Yeah, just go drive, <laughs> kind of. So we fly to the first one. I land. I go. They go do what they do. I sit in the you know in the, in the pilot's lounge or whatever the lounge thing was. Forty minutes go by. They're not back yet. Marine layers coming in. Fog is coming in, right? And five minutes later, forty-five minutes later, or so they come and they go. Okay, we're ready to go to the next one. It's like we can't go to the next one because I can't see the next one, kind of thing, you know. And they're like, well, you know, your boss said that, you know, <laughs> you can take it and we got a and time and then we got a flight to catch it. We have to, da, 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 that kind of right. thing. And this actually relates to something that happened recently that, 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 that I spoke to this about because somebody asked me about it and I'll tell you about it in a second. So I'm like, all right, well, let's, let me try, let me see to get to the, you know, so they get in and start the thing up and take off and they go, and I know it's that way. I know it's due east to get to this, almost due east to get to this next oil derrick. So I fly off of this one in the fog. I'm over the ocean in the fog. I start flying towards the next oil derrick in the fog. I can only see about 300 feet in front of me. Going really slow. They're talking, you know, they're talking, you know, they're strategizing how to take over this, you know, Pacific Rim company kind of thing. Fine. So they're not paying attention to me, which is great. So I decide. Uh, the only way I'm going to see that thing is to climb up through the clouds and see where the flag is. There's going to be a flag on each of these derricks, and the flag is generally next to the helipad, and maybe I can see it, you know, and land on it, maybe. Because the heat from the helipad will dissipate the clouds kind of thing, so I can go up the clouds and I come straight down and land. Right. So I start, to, my, I start to look for a hole in the thing, in the clouds, you know, so I can climb up above this thing. 
and this is a little complicated, but not too complicated, so I'll try to make it really simple for you. Uh, you can, when you flying, it, this is the up and, right? This is the, up, this kind of thing, when you're, the stick, right? The cyclic, and this is the collective, this is the power, this is accelerated. So this kind of pulls you up, this does, and this makes you rock back and forth like this. So I got this doing, going on, so I'm starting to do that, right? And I'm slowing down because I don't want to, Right, so I'm slowing down. And I'm looking for this hole, and what's happening with this hand is as I'm looking for this hole, my hand is creeping forward a little bit, like, right? So what I don't know is happening is as I'm doing this, I'm doing mm. that while I'm looking for this hole. Uh. Right? And that only happens for like, a few seconds. So I can't find this hole. Blah, blah. And when, when, and I'm slow enough that I'm almost hovering, which means I'm I'm in dirty air. Right. The air is coming down. Right. So when you start to fly out of dirty air, when you start to speed up in a helicopter, you have the helicopter does this shake. It is shake. You can feel it. Everybody can feel it. But you, you specifically know mm -hmm. it. It's, it's called active translational lift, and it's the shutters. Right. So I'm almost out of hover. Right. So and then the helicopter shutters. My first thought is, I'm speeding up. Why am I speeding up? I look down at the altimeter and it's going down. And look at my hand, it's been going down. And I can't jerk the thing back so we don't stop you know, going down. So I do this really smooth, slow thing so they won't notice <laughs> the whole thing, right? <laughs> so I come out, I level off. When I level off, water splashes on my windshield. Oh! I was about four and a half feet above the ocean. Oh! And That's a... And <laughs> the pontoons so a millisecond later we'd have been in the water mm. wow 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 yeah. wow wow man that's uh my butt would be super tight yeah man yeah i was their color there did they know <laughs> did they have any idea okay well no, then no, you no. yeah well played there you go we're not we're not we're, I, we can't see there, the thing there's your out. there's your a acting you know there's your best performance of the year right there right yeah, but, well, it was going to say on that, and I, and I don't want to get too, I don't want to get too model, but I want to make this point that you guys haven't spoken about this before, we haven't spoken about it, is that that came from this perceived uh, uh, authority pressure, right? You've got to make this happen or else we're going to tell your boss and blah, blah, blah. Now, if I was just say it was just me, the pilot, and just go, oh, no, we're not going to do that. Right. And that's the end of it. You find your own way home. You know, but it was like you know, the boss and the thing, we got the time and the money and the Pacific Rim company. And the I'm like, okay, let's try it. That's what happened in the Kobe Bryant case. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, uh, right? Okay. He's, he's got to get to the game. I don't want to make him late. I don't want to lose my job. You know, right. it's kind of foggy. It's all of that. That's, and that's, that is what accounts for 90% of all, uh, all aircraft accidents. Okay, now you brought this up, so this is this is your you open the door here. Um, when you are, is it hard to find people that will shoot you straight? You know, when you are when you are a when you are when you are a star, when you're a celebrity, when you're you know in the industry, and yeah. you know everybody sort of is there's that hmm, what's the word for it like everybody's kind of there's this magnetism there you know everybody wants to connect with somebody that's uh, of stature uh, that that's a celebrity and yeah. it's like there's this there's this reality bubble this distortion bubble around and, and nobody will shoot you straight like do you it, it do you find that to be the case is it is it uh, you, you see where I'm going with this? Is it sometimes people won't tell? You, you have to find a group of people that you get that that you get that from who don't who don't think that you're in a position to help them or are going to be in a position to help them, right? Well, so no one wants to say anything that may come back later on. They're up for a role, Al, you know, and they said some crappy stuff to you, and now you're you're the director of yeah. that movie. So now everybody's careful about what. So yeah, yeah. So you have to get so it, so, which explains to to a degree why a lot of celebrities have 
right? They're, they're, they're the same people work together all the time, or the same people are together all the, or are together all the time. Why, why do you have their own entourage? Like Kevin Hart has his own little entourage of guys who are not going to BS him about anything. Right, you know, right. You're paying me anyway. And I, was your, I was your friend before you were who you right. are. So, yeah, it, it it can be, it can be, and and mostly is that because everyone isn't sure what you are are or are going well, to be. It's like there's this angle. Uh, everybody's got some angle that they're trying to play, and uh, except yeah. for you, Marlon, and uh, and and it's like <laughs> what what can I leverage? And there may be some, you know you know, Avenue down the road, like you said, that guy may end up a director and we've all lost sight of just, well, what, just do the right thing. You know, it's, I mean, it's easy for me to say, cause I'm, you know, not, you know, but. but to, 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 to that point, I, I don't go to a lot of these, those parties. Yeah. Right? That's why a lot of people go to those parties, you know, but so I don't go to a lot of them because I don't have that. I don't have that tool, right? Uh, anymore, I should say. I think I, you know, when you first start out, you're just mm-hmm. trying to, you know, I need an agent, and I need to find somebody who has an agent, and somebody who might help me get an agent. You know, this is 30 years ago, right? But now, at this point, in this is probably the last 20 years, is this? You're either going to hire me or you're not. Right, you're either going to be impressed by what I do or not. So it doesn't matter how much, you know. But I kiss. Yeah, it, it, you know, it just it doesn't it doesn't matter, right. you know. And, that's, and if that's if that is what you need in order to give me, you know, a, a break or give me a shot at this thing, then what does it say about me? Or your I, work environment for you, that shoot. Right. So, so it's what's so what's what's acting is living, right? In, in my opinion, and it's so. Who do you want to be as a person? Either you're acting, or you're producing, or you're directing. Who do you want to be as a person? Because that's an integrity thing to me, right? This is it's a self-esteem thing. It's who do you who, who do you want to tell your kids you are, right? You know, or show them who you are. You know, how'd you get that role, Dad? Well, I had to kiss that guy's butt. And, party and I had a hang yeah right just get it on your you didn't just get it on your talent and your morality well no I threw it out the window and you know <laughs> I knew so a guy what, who knew a guy who knew a guy and at, yeah. at, at exactly. what point did you start to rely on your skill set and your talent and your ability and go this is what's gonna this is this is what's gonna be my my deciding factor about 25 All years right. yep when, when I uh, this this is this is another acting thing, and this is a Mar- this is also a Marlon says so thing. Uh, but but it's hey, says so. You got the button, Keith, before uh, he goes there. Wait, the Mar the Marlon <laughs> says so thing. Yeah. I tell you what. So you deliver on that promise, I give you half off. But if he wears his hat, <laughs> that's you. You probably can't hear it that well. That's your uh, Rufus character. That's, that's Rufus uh, negotiating yep. to get his hat on yeah. there. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. So and, and to 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 that right. So I figured out. I had to figure out what it is. What is what is it I'm trying to do as a? As, I don't know. Be a, I knew I wanted to be a character actor. I don't know. I think the leading man thing. You get chosen to be a leading man. So I just want to work to be a really good character actor. Right, and do a bunch of different characters. And then I. I figured out, and I had to figure this out so I get to tell it to young actors. But I figured out what exactly are you selling? Because that's, for me, that's the business of it. Because a lot of times you come, a lot of times, if not most of the time, when you talk to somebody about the business, they'll say, you know, it's called show business. So show and business. So you have to know the business. I don't believe that. I believe my agent and my manager and my lawyer have to know the business. I, <laughs> I have to do the show, right? The only bit of business I think I need to, to know is what I'm selling. What is there a product, right? Essentially. So what am I selling? That's different than what Jay is selling or what Keith is selling. Right. Because 
if you're a comedian, anybody can be funny. But how are you specifically funny? And it's what I call the essence of you, right? And I think that's what takes acting class and you know, getting on stage and figuring it all out. And the essence of you is this one sentence thing that describes, you know, it, it isn't you, but it's it's kind of what you bring to the table as a as an actor, right? Robert De Niro does the same character, essentially, in any role that he does. That's the essence of him. It's not Robert, but that's the essence of him. And we know we're gonna get that. Even if he even if he's in a comedy. The the Robert De Niro in Goodfellas is the same guy as in Anal Analyze This with Billy Crystal, but he added timing to it. But it's the same guy. Yeah. It's it's that brand. It, yeah, it's yeah. your brand. It's basically what it is. And this is funny. It, t it ties into what we're doing too. Same similar situation. There are so many out there. You got to be, you got to stand out. You got to sell what you're doing. What are you doing? Because a lot of people can get on that thing and just talk to people. But what's, what, how are you? So I figured out what my, what my brand was about 25 years ago. And then it was like, and then I perfected that brand. So now when I get called in, they know they're getting the Marlon Young brand. Right. And that's cool because right. it's easy for them too because they see they know what you are. And that's right. that is the person we want for the it fits <clears throat> known for commodities this role. tend yeah, to absolutely. be uh less risky from a from a you know, they're all they're what regardless of how you view the industry, they're lending money to somebody and they're just trying to make sure that that investment gets a good return that's exactly right that's right nobody's trying to make a rich you you'll never do rocky won't, ex won't exist again okay so you 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 tweeted this you instagram this I, I i i might i might be following you on instagram i'm not sure <laughs> but you made a reference to and i and i don't check a lot of social media but for some reason that one showed up and uh, you were like, this will never happen again. Can you elaborate right. on that a little bit? Why? Sure. Sylvester Stallone wanted to be an actor and that he desperately wanted to be an actor. And he did stage and I think, he, I, I, I mean, he's been out there, but I, I think he did a, a soft, soft core porn movie. And, but he definitely had to sell his dog because he was trying to get he, just money to live, yep. you know? He, 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 as a waiter and work as whatever to work on this acting thing, and he decided to write this movie. He said, "I'm going to write a role for me because he he couldn't get the roles that he wanted." Right, so he wrote Rocky. He wrote Rocky, I think, in less than a week. Right, and then he went around shopping it to producers and whoever said, "You know, this thing," and and a lot of them loved it, and they said, "Yeah, we'll give you a hundred thousand dollars for that script." And he says, "No, no, I want to play Rocky." And nobody wanted to do that for him. He said, no, you're not. Who are you to play? No, we'll give it to this star. We'll give it to this other star. We don't, nobody knows who you are, man. But he refused to sell it unless he played the lead. Ultimately, he, got, he, he came in touch with Erwin Winkler, read the script, and said, OK, we'll put the money behind this guy nobody knows. And this script that is good, but I don't know. Nobody knows this kid. So let's try it. And it became what it became. That'll never happen again. What will happen now is what you just said. How do we guarantee get our money back? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So different, different, different playing field now. Yeah. 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 I feel what we're doing. It's, uh, you know, it's, we have to check with, okay, how is this, how is this story play in, in Denmark, how does the story play in Australia? How can we sell the foreign rights first? This is what our movie is going to be about. We sell the, or you would buy it, or you would be interested in that. Okay, you, okay, no, okay, okay then. So we we know who's going to buy it. Now we know we're going to get our money back. Okay, and that, and that determines what the budget is going to be. You know? All right. So, yes. So to that degree, uh, uh, Rocky, the Rocky story will never happen. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good. That's a good point. Your your Netflix project that you're working on, um, I know you can't speak about it, but when 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 may we expect to see see you on there soon soon or uh, the, Netflix, the Netflix I can tell you about, and the other show I can tell okay. you about. I can't tell you a lot about the film. Okay, 
the the, the Netflix show it, it, because it's on. It, it, this is the uh, this is the fourth season. Okay. I think I misspoke when I said it was a new show. It's the fourth season. It's a kid. It's, it's a young person growing up in South Los Angeles show uh, called On My Block. Okay. And uh, coming of age of young, but it's, it's apparently a very popular show that I haven't seen. Right. Uh, the, the the woman who created that show years ago, seven, eight years ago, uh, created a pilot for ABC that I auditioned for and got uh, this third, third lead on the show. It didn't go, right? They didn't pick it up to, to for you know, to air again seven, seven, eight years ago, I think it was. I never saw her again. I never read for her again. I never auditioned for her again. Uh, I never, well, for the most part, didn't speak to her after that. You know, just go on with the thing. And then, so that's that. I'm in Oakland uh, filming a show that hasn't come out. It's, it's coming out on Stars. There was a movie in 2018 called Blind Spotting. Okay. Uh, critical acclaim takes place in Oakland. Uh, you know, young black guy with the cops and then his white friends and their best friends and he can't stay out of jail. And apparently, really good movie. And I hadn't seen it before, but uh, and I and I hadn't heard about it. Heard hadn't heard about it, but then I heard about it. I was like, oh, that's funny. so I get you know an audition for this thing, and uh, so I get to shoot that. I'm a recurring character on that. Awesome. Show. That, right? So, uh, which I, I play a parole officer for one of the lead kids, and it's a really comical relationship, uh, a lot of fun. While I'm there, and I don't know when I come, I haven't, it, I don't know when that airs yet, but it will be coming out soon, and I will let you know. Perfect. While I'm there filming that, my agent calls me and says, "You have been offered a role on this show called On My Block." Okay. By who? By the woman who created the show that ah. was <clears throat> seven years ago. She remembered you, remembered your brand. Right. Brand fits perfectly into this role. So there's no auditioning necessary. We know what we're getting when we call Marlon. Right. That's perfect. So, I, so yeah, yeah. So I'm a recurring character right now on, on two separate shows. That's awesome. That's so good that you're working, man. And again, that was kind of where we were going with this initially in the beginning about COVID and how it's affected, you know, the industry as a whole and how we do things these days. But it's so good to hear you're working, you know, and um, obviously a lot, a lot of other people are too. Um, I think that um, there's going to be some. I I think it's, I, I think there are going to be less of these tentpole movies. It makes me a little sad, yeah. uh, but before I... Uh, so just real quick, Netflix uh, Season 3 of On My Block uh, is out now. Uh, it sounds like uh, you're going to be able to catch Marlin on Season 4 when that airs. Yes. So get caught up, everybody, before then, and then and then you'll... Yes. Uh, and, then, and then you'll be ready. So, yeah, yeah man, I... I loved the last Avengers movie. I loved, uh, I I'm really looking forward to top gun. Uh, I'm trying to think of the big, big blockbusters that I've seen in the past couple of years. I mean, um, there is a certain amount of kind of Disney magic to a lot of that CGI that, you know, uh, the Batman movies or whatever, you know, a lot of the, the, the wonder woman movie that came out on HBO, uh, was, I thought, yeah pretty great uh you know yeah. I, I think i'll miss those i i really do i, I you know if you haven't oh. seen uh falcon and the winter soldier uh which is now i think they just finished airing the season finale that's on disney plus um I know it's, on. it's good I man seen. it's good and they did a re- oh. and they did a Oh, they did. Uh, this is this is. They did a great job of using conversational aspects to draw you in because they couldn't rely on high budget CGI. 
So you have a you have a scenario where they're like they're literally broaching. There, there's a there's a character in the in the series, and he's a, a war veteran, and and he's black, and he looks at uh, Sam, and he goes, "They'll never be a black Captain America. Just forget about it ever happening." And it, we're we're kind of dealt with that. Like, can he pick up the mantle, and will it be you know? It, we're, like we're pulled into this story and rooting for it to happen. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And they're, 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 whoever did the writing on that, it was really, really good. But I digress. I, I think the, I, I almost feel like we're going to have this roaring 20s thing when it comes back. People are just going to go to the movies in mass because they've missed like watching Godzilla on the big screen or whatever. I hope so. I, I really I, I, I like I wanted to watch Godzilla. I just brought that up. It's on. Uh, I don't know, HBO yep. Max or whatever. Yeah, it is, yes. Right? And I don't, I, for whatever, it's not on my TV. We've got these TVs that not, I think they're now four, four years old. So you have to, so all the apps yeah. that are on it are on it, download it, put it on it. So I've got HBO Max on my phone. And I've done that before. I play something on my phone and, you know, it'll go, right? You put it on airplane, it goes to TV, yep. just leave the phone. And it's great. Godzilla keeps cutting out. <laughs> yeah. And then it'll start to play no sound. Sound for the trailer of whatever the movie is before the trailer, or the trailer is before the movie. Movie starts zero. No sound. Probably. I go to Reddit. If I had to. I go to Reddit. Everybody's venturing a guess here, but however the audio was mixed is not you know you, if you're doing it like from your phone and it's trying to send that it has to there's some magic going on where it's either having to uh multi what's the word it's uh it's 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 basically converting on the fly down to a stereo stream or something like that you know if they've got 5.1 or 7.1 or whatever it's having to convert and it sounds like the two ain't talking and playing nice it yeah. together it, it, it Heartens me to know that other people have had the problem, right? Because, like I said, with the Reddit and the like, oh, yeah. you know, a lot of people have had the problem. Not alone. But, you know, it's it's blown past $400 million worldwide, worldwide right? So it's playing somewhere. Right. It's HBO Max on my friggin' phone. So, but I want to see it. My, my point is, I I, I would want to see that. I would, I would like to go to the theater and say, I'd love to go to the theater and see, see Top Gun. Right. And I hope that people i hope they will I, I really hope they will i just think i just like my feeling is that the convenience of what COVID has created is going to take away from the theater experience i i i think that would you be out. now I you hope. said earlier and now i'm i'm, I'm repeating you i'm going to parrot this back to you you said from an artistic perspective you would be okay with them experiencing the show in a different medium other than a theater why why not do doing some drive-in stuff like you get a big screen uh i'm not sure how they would work out the audio thing but you get your you get your space i guess you know you can still get concessions if you want them i i, it, it, I think convenience trumps okay it. yeah you're probably right i, I do i mean i i could jay you could Tell me both of you can tell me whether what, what you guys think, but I, I I think the convenience of of getting this quality thing in the house it trumps getting my car and going yeah. to see it. One, two. There's so much good stuff coming out on yeah. Apple TV, and it's it now it's now it's uh, uh, it's rivaling. You these big you got to have a reason to get out of the house yeah yeah you know and like we like we had mentioned to you i mean apple well i saw uh uh at one of the tech shows recently where they came out with the the this device that can you have to pay to watch the movie and it knows how many people are in the room um that's a you know we talked about that that's an option that may may be on the table in the future but you know i have to say you know i'm i'm a convenience kind of guy i was never a big go to the movie theater except for when i live back home the, the old palmetto theater man yeah. remember that right uh, um by the way i remember having to sit in the balcony oh, and you- i sat in that balcony 
for a lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> saw some really good movies there. Sm- saw Smokey and the Bandit there. Just saw, not why. Just yes. not why you were sitting in the balcony, right? Right. Saw okay. Ten there. Okay. Uh, saw <laughs> Up in Smoke by Cheech and Chong there. Saw. I mean, I saw some really good movies there. Um, I saw Star Wars. What's that? I saw Star Wars. Did there. you really? I don't remember where. I think I was in Florida when I saw Star Wars and Jaws. Uh, saw Jaws. I have a very sick stepfather who took us to see, my sister and I and my mother, to see Jaws, the first movie, um, on a Friday night and wakes us all up early Saturday morning and says, hey, we're going to the beach. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, nice. he's a very, very strange (laughs) sense of humor this guy has. Love him to death, though, man. But um, back to the, you know, for, for me, I think, you know, I like going to specific types of movie at the theater, you know, and, and, and you mentioned Godzilla, that would be a movie that I would want to go see in a theater or the, the top gun, uh, coming out, you know, and I, I dig those types of movies in, in, in those settings, but there are certain types of movies that I like in front of my 65 inch TV in my recliner too, you know, cause I really get so involved in them that idiot next to me on his cell phone taking the call you know that i want to punch really hard with that those are the things that really irritate me about being in a theater but again it has its place and i think for keith keith is just you know and i'm speaking for keith but you know he's got a young son that enjoys him too happens a lot you're welcome to do that yeah go ahead (laughs) yeah but that's a point i mean if that's something that you enjoy doing with your children then it's really an important thing and um I, I, I do hope that we can find some sort of happy place with that to happen in the future. I think it will, but maybe not at the degree that it is that it has been in the past. So, I think you landed on something. I mean, we're just you know we're just three guys talking. About, yeah. Right? Uh, but because when I'm a distributor and well, I lost a great idea. Let's do what those guys, those weird guys on that podcast <laughs> talked about. <laughs> but I think that. What you what you just said is, is it may be the balance, right? I want to go to the theater to see uh, Top Gun, but I can watch Nomadland on my couch. Right. You know, like no, that's this is I don't have to go to see that one. As opposed to no, we go we go to the theater to see every movie. No, see these here, and then, and I think the studio will have to shift to that, right? Like how much do we what do where do we want to put this movie now? No, now we make it. Do we partner with Netflix and just let Netflix air it, you know, and not put and not go to you know to you know whatever the cinema the, the cinema people are and you know put it up in a general sort right. of thing, you know? So less of those, which is just going to hurt the, the movie business, the, the, the cinema business, right? I mean, if you if you own a bunch of AM, you know AMC or AMC like theaters, it's just going to your money comes. From I have a prediction. So. I, I know nothing about the entertainment industry. Uh, this is a complete layman's. I, I like doing these, Marlon, so we can come back to it in six months. And if it happens, then we can go. I told you so. Uh, but let's just see. Okay, let's just see. So maybe in a year, the shakes loose. This is my prediction. There's going to be some kind of deal brokered um, in the, in the, in the, from the distribution side where... They're going to make if they're going to make a tentpole movie, then they're going to make that decision from the beginning and they're going to say, OK, this is going to be, you know, this, this is Black Widow, right, which I think is coming out this summer or, you know, whatever the next Marvel movie is or right. This is the next Top Gun. These are tentpole. We know going into this, this is there. If we're not sure that then it defaults to streaming. If we're not sure how much it's going to make, it's going to default to streaming. If we're going into this with a $500 million budget, it's a tentpole movie. This is what I think you're, there's going to be a clear line drawn. They're going to make some sort of deal with the cinemas. And they're going to say, we're going to raise ticket prices. People are going to pay $25, $30 bucks a ticket for these blockbusters. And they'll do it because they're big deal movies with high dollar budget CGI. Everything else... Okay. You can you you movie theaters have the right you can show it, but we're gonna all, we're just gonna do like HBO did with Wonder Woman. We're gonna release it simultaneously. What do they call that, Jay? Day and date. Day and date. And they're yep. just gonna do it the same everywhere. So you're gonna yeah. have two ticket prices going on at the theaters based on what kind of movie it is. Yeah, that's interesting. We'll see. So people will do that. 
Yeah. Oh, absolutely they will. I mean, they do it. They do yeah. it. And I mean, if you look at the concert model. Yeah, I'd shell out 30 bucks a, a ticket for the next Star Wars movie. I'd do right. it. Yeah, I probably would too. You know, it's like going to see, you know, one of your favorite bands or something. You're going to pay 45, yeah. 50, 100 bucks a seat, right? You know? I mean, I, I mean, people do it. You know, would so I do it? Why wouldn't you pay 25, 30 bucks? An independent film that I hadn't heard of before that we're kind of interested not. in. Yeah, probably probably want to go, you know, stream that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dude, I, listen, I, he, 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 I just, I know this is, this is a weird segue, but I, I just want to get my car into resto. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I just, I, I want to get that done. It, it, it's really it's causing me a little bit of anxiety, and, and but you know you spoke about it the other day. It, it, it tell I'll tell your audience what we're talking about because we, we talked about it the last time, and it still hasn't happened yet. Right. right? But it's a delay on getting parts for mechanics. Right. Right. And my mechanic is a you know he specializes in 5.0 Mustangs. Partic- this particular year, mine's a '91. So that's a Fox body, uh, yeah. Fox yeah. body, yeah. And uh, COVID hit, factory shut down. I was gonna take it in like the next, the, the, that March, I think it was. Nothing. So I can't have many people take it in. And what my, my thought was, okay, well, when we open back up, I'll be first in line, kind of right. thing. Still haven't gotten a parts. Right. Now the person's gotta finish that car, he's gotta finish this other one. And you, you, you you both uh, you know, allayed a little bit of my anxiety the last time we, we, we spoke, which was that's happening industry wide. It is. So since we spoke, yeah. Ironically, uh, I think I told you this, Jay. Ford yeah. halted production on some of their Mustang models as of last week because they can't. It's get on our list of yeah. It's on our list of things to talk about. Um, yep. Soon. Uh, so we so might now as well you talk have, about it now. Now you know firsthand. General Motors the, halting production yeah. on uh, several vehicles, including the Camaro. Mm-hmm. Ford halting production on their Mustang. This is... I'm not trying to run around yelling the sky is falling and freak people out. I am very nervous about this. Because as the auto industry goes, typically, historically, so does our economy. And if we can't get parts to make cars we can't sell cars and if we can't sell cars the economy's not going to go it's that's not good right and the other thing that we're finding too is that you've heard you've heard of the the the, the microchip shortage right that's going on no. semiconductor okay, so shortage semiconductor shortages okay so okay. everything electronic has a semiconductor in it these days so they're being used for everything appliances Your refrigerator has everything. them refrigerator. Yep, everything yeah everything so now doorbell the automotive the automotive industry uses a lot of these semiconductors as well and they can't get them and that's why they're shutting these these uh, production lines down because they can't get them um, it's a big big deal and as Keith was alluding to, you know, if, if, if we can't sell cars, if we can't make cars, that's going to be a big gut punch for us, man. Um, and they were not prepared for this. And the sad thing about it is, is they are trying to get people to start up production on product that they've never made to the degree some of these other specialized yep. companies have. What does that do to your product? The end result, you get some half-assed vehicles that are out there that will be constantly in the shop because they're poorly manufactured. Ford is skipping some of the components in, I think it was their fuel regulation system on their F-150 trucks. For that reason, they just didn't have the part. Mm -hmm. And the truck is fine without it, but there's there's an element of, well, it's a little less in quality, right? You could make that argument. It doesn't have that I don't think they're skipping safety features, but it, it could be fuel management or something like that. Well, it will be, and it'll totally affect the emission controls on yeah. these things to the point to where these guys that have come out like GM and, and um, uh, well, GM specifically saying they're going to be completely yeah. carbon neutral by 2035 and 2040 and never make another right. gasoline engine because of that. Um, 
I think that they have to take a hard look at this because they're not going to be able to meet some of those goals. Well, uh, with with things going on like this. Yeah, yeah. The electric stuff is no different. And it, here, this is a little bit off the nerd deep end, but this will kind of solidify uh, what's going on. So I had a Mac Pro. This was what they used to call the old cheese grater. It was about ten years old. It was one of those really big used it for video edit. it was my edit box it was really powerful and it had like 12 computer cores in it and it's insane well that stuff 10 years old it shouldn't be worth a lot right and i've i've finally transitioned everything off of it and it's time for it to go and cleaned it off and, and it's a good rig but it's 10 years old it's it's a 10 year old computer like you're not going to get anything for that but because nobody can get graphics cards now because nobody can get computer parts in terms of the the chips like i just put it out on like a users group on facebook and i've got people going crazy going i i just you know will you part it out like i'm desperate i'll give you 500 bucks for the graphics card and i'm going holy That's cow crazy. like this is you know i i thought i wasn't gonna you know things heavy it's probably gonna cost a hundred dollars to ship it and we are in that shape right now. People are so desperate for components. And and again, I'm not trying to... I'm just seeing this firsthand. I, I hope it's... I hope I'm wrong. Where's the, where's the, where's the desperation coming from? Who, who, who's, who's not making well, the semiconductor? Well, opera- I think what hurt them is these factories have always been, in the past three or four years, operating at close to capacity, you know, 85 90% of what their full production capacity could be. And then they stop production during COVID for months. And so you've got. And there was no safety backlog. stock. There was no, no safety right. stock. And so you've got, you know, Ford in line and GM in line going, where's our stuff? And then you've got, you know, LG and Samsung and, and Kenmore over here going, hey, we need we need these parts for our refrigerator. And who do you who do you supply first? You know, right. And that's the problem you have is that these are companies that want it JIT, which is just in time yeah. for production, because they don't they don't necessarily want to inventory those things because it's it's overhead. So they rely on the replenishment programs and, and the safety stock that they have set in place. And when China's not communicating with the US because of COVID, everything's shut down, everybody's just like, you know, they're running around with their hands in the air, don't know what to do. This is what happens. And, you know, Keith, as we were talking about this right now, you know, it affects every aspect of what we do in life today because these semiconductors are used in everything. And I just, I'm sitting here thinking about the computer aspect of it. Um, you know, we have, we don't know the ripple effect that that's going to be down the road for us yet in the computer industry itself. I don't, I don't know the PC industry, the app, you know, the MacBook Pros and stuff like that. How are they going to continue well, to, to survive? They're a big player, and they are admitting that they're facing these same challenges as is, you know, Dell and some of the other ones. Uh, and it has delayed some of their product releases, but you know, they're, I mean, they're it, Apple's first in line, right? And and if people do not believe that this is a crisis, um, I mean. The Biden administration is involved in it now to that point. When there you have been in, conversations with yes. the uh, semiconductor manufacturers going, what can we do to help? Like, Right. Yeah. yeah so you know it's the a, government's yeah. involved. Yeah. Yeah. Why doesn't Apple or, or Dell, with all of their capital capacity, have their own? Well, Apple just did, uh, but they're still made. They don't. They don't make them. They're manufactured in China, so they design it and then they send right. it off to a manufacturing facility somewhere. And there, there are places near you. There's some. There's some places in California that do it. Yeah, um, and some that, places here too. I think yeah. up in Seattle area. Yeah, yeah, but that's a small percentage of what supplies the world because it's cheaper to mass produce them. You know, elsewhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, big guy, nickel yeah. an hour. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, that's absolutely true. And I've been into some of those plants over there, man. And it's it's um, it, it'll it'll make you scratch your head, going, whoa, you know, this, <laughs> is, this is um, this is what what kind of what was your, what what kind of head scratching thing? The conditions that these people work in. I mean, yeah. you go into our plants here in this in the states because of OSHA regulations and all of the regulations we have in place and the EPA is involved. We have all of these, 
you know, government um, entities that are watchdogs over this stuff. And then you have unions that make sure there's safety for people and, you know, all, they have the correct PPE, you know, all of that stuff, right? right. Which, which you, you need to have that. I mean, it's the right thing to do. You, you want to protect your worker from harmful things yeah. and, and, a, and, you know, potential life loss. I've walked into these plants and and the conditions are just horrible. Um, you know, in the middle of the summer, these people are working with hot forging um, and just sitting right next to these huge, you know, forging machines. It, temperatures are at 800 degrees. They're just pouring sweat, man. And the floors are just nasty. There's no like relieving stations. There's no. There's nothing. And they do this stuff for you know 12, 14 hours a day. Um, the air is dirty. Uh, I, I the first time I went to China, um, it took me two days to get used to the air. Period. My throat burned. It was so bad, just just the pollution in the air. My throat and my nose wow. and my eyes burned, and I finally got used to it after about two, three days. It was pretty rough. How long were you there? Um, anytime I traveled over there, and I've been, I've probably been, I don't know, six, seven times, uh, typically 14 days or so, at least 14 days. The longest I've stayed was nearly three weeks. Um, but that would be going from like Hong Kong into Guangzhou and then to Chengdu and then up to uh, Wailin and then to uh, Beijing and then back down to Shanghai and, you know, just all over. I've, I've traveled pretty deep in country there for manufacturing. Yeah. So. And a noticeable difference, a noticeable difference in your, in your health. Um, when you get back, I mean, yeah. when, you get, you know, when you get back, it's like, okay. A while to get to breathe clean. Yeah, I mean, I think the first time that I went, I did. Uh, It seemed like every time I traveled in, though, that they would improve upon something. So the experience has got a lot better. You know, like we, it takes us 10 years to think about building a highway. And then we've got so many regulations you have to go through to build that highway. Like you can't cross this creek, so you got to go around this creek, or you can't dig a tunnel through this mountain, you got to go around this mountain. Not the Chinese, man. They're like, they're digging right through, dude. They don't care. And so the times that I traveled over there, like the first time I went, it took me, I flew into Hong Kong, and then I had a, a two-hour train ride to Guangzhou, and then we were picked up by our drivers to go to the plant that we were visiting. Well, it took us two days to get to the plant. First trip. Second time I go over. Hong Kong, Guangzhou, train ride. Uh, they've got a brand new super highway built through. Took us three hours to get there. Two days the first time I went, three hours the second time. Next time I go, same route, Hong Kong, Guangzhou. But when I get to Guangzhou, I take a high-speed rail because now they've built high-speed rail from point A to point B. So now it only takes me an hour. This is this is they're getting stuff done over there. I mean, I guess that's what communism does. I, you know, I, I don't I don't know. Um, we we apparently have too much red tape in this country to get things done, and we need some infrastructure badly now. Uh, but we'll we'll see what happens with it. But yeah, I it's 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 kind of it's sad to see some of the the working conditions that those people um, are put into. But I do believe that some of that is getting better for them um, because I think the people are demanding it. And um, a larger group of people tend to kind of get the the attention of those that are in charge. So I think that they don't want to be put on you know in the world spotlight like they have been. And I think that's uh, that's making a difference. So listen, that, that that's that's the only way to change anything, right? I mean, unless you're counting on the altruism of those in charge, right. you know, is the people have to go. All right, this needs to change. Right. You know? That's absolutely. Yeah. Now, but yeah, it doesn't have to change tomorrow, but we want you to pay attention. Absolutely. To out loud, you know, and that would be look, not unlike what's going on in our, in, in our country. Absolutely. Now, right. For the last couple of years. Absolutely. It's just that. It's like, uh, look, we just want you to pay attention to That's it. That's it. All of it. You know, put that guy in jail. You know, put that guy in jail. 
you know, there's one of the, this, the paper, you know, uh, the news recently, uh, 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 the second Harvey Weinstein, you know, Scott Rudin, you know, has been, he's coming under fire. The same this guy's been an a-hole for 30 years. Right. And then starting to speak up now, you know, he's yelling at people, throwing, you know, threatening people, throwing telephones and cups at people. He's been doing it, threatening fire people for no reason. And, okay, so now he's starting to lose it. So I've been complaining about this to HR since 2003. Why are you not, why are you not listening? Right. So now they're listening. And it's like, that's all we want is for you, you know, you and from this number of us, this, you know, this group of us who've been complaining about this, these working conditions, right. you know, to do something about it. Or at least listen to it. Yeah, for sure. I, I I do hope that we're in a, uh, and I know I'm I, I I'm sure Keith agrees with this, that we are in a unique time right now where we're seeing so much thrown at us at one time. Oh, for sure. Changes, changes, I mean, it's, and it's. I think. Yeah, it's monumental. I think we're. Yeah, I think we're going to come out of this. I I hope that we're going to come out of all of this on the other side of this thing and in, in, in a better place, man. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, this is, this is the optimist in me, but, you know, I, 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 I do feel like, you know, we've had our toys taken away for a while and we're, you know, kind of been told, look, if you can't, you can't get along, then, you know, you can't have them back. And now we're starting to get some of them back and we all kind of remember you know, I don't want to go back to that. So let's let's you know let's let's all try to get along. I hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. yeah listen, for you know, for, for for the good good of it. All, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Is, yeah. This is what that. But yeah, you remember iteration? I mean, even when I talk about it, it sounds like it sounds like we're a hundred years. Yeah. Old. Well, I mean, you you look, man. I mean, you you hit on it just moments ago when we were talking about the, the Palmetto Theater. I mean, look at look at how far we've come since then. I mean, you know, when you brought that up, it's like, oh wow, that's right, man. You know, and it's uh, what's weird to me though is that we still are in the same place in a lot of that those aspects of what we were encountering back then, which is sad because there's been so yeah, much yeah. time go by that something that should have been fixed and should have been righted is still not completely righted. And we've got a lot of work to do together, man. We really do. Yeah, listen, it's just, it's all just conversation. I, you know, when you know my colleagues and I talk about it, I guess I can call them colleagues or friends or acquaintances here, we talk about it from, you know, from all the, from the, from the, right, the spectrum of the right. rainbow, right? It's all, right. it's, it's just have the conversation. Right. And if what has happened, yeah, at least in my lifetime, I, that I've noticed because part of my job, if not my my entire job, is to observe the is observe humanity mm. and then you know turn it into a, build a character out of it and you know turn it into something. Uh, is we we talked about it. Listen, listen, the fifties and sixties were no joke about that, right? I mean, it was harsh conversations and rocks and dogs and. All of it that went in is just a lot of people aren't here anymore who were standing up for that thing, you know, or, or those, you know, those basic rights, the, <laughs> this basic civil rights, just to be civil, right? You know, nothing above that, just civil to each other. So they went through all of that, and then I think what happened, and you know, and the, as we went, in, you know, you and I went to grade school and going into high school, all of us we going to grade school, going to high school, is at some point we went, so we're good now, right? I mean, we got the Jeffersons. We got good times. <laughs> we got the Cosby. We're all good. Right. Yeah. Let's stop talking yeah. about that. You know? And you stop doing it. I, I remember. I, 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 uh, it was the second year they integrated El Barnwell Elementary, mm. right? And my homeroom teacher followed us. When, when recess happened, she would follow us down to you know, the lunch in that big playground, you know, it was eight acre playground or whatever it was. And she would make sure that black kids didn't congregate with black kids and white kids didn't just congregate with white kids. Because like, I get this is uncomfortable. It's brand new yeah. for all of us, but it ain't 
you guys, if all of you go over there and all of you go over there. So she would come out and get us. It was scary because you're like, I don't know what I'm going to get going over this group of kids. But she would come out and she'd go, Jay, you can go play with the black kids. And Marlon, you go over there with the white kids. And Sharon, you go into, you know right. what I mean? And it forced it on us. It was a little bit scary, but it was necessary. Yeah. In, right? So from a, from a, you know, from a larger standpoint, we, we stopped doing that. Right. And we need I mean, just in conversation, forcing people to go whatever, right? Because we tried that with affirmative action, that kind of back, backfired on us, right? So let's just have the conversation. We stopped having the conversation, right? And I think I think that's and, and that's just from this, you know, racial aspect. But uh, you know, gender-wise, same thing. Women have been complaining about X for a long time, and you know, and women working for men, women, you know. Right. It's all I mean, people been t- so now we've been list- now we're at a place where it's happening on a, on such a scale in- enough globally that people are listening and and that for me is the is the better other side right yeah right, right. yeah to to be having that yeah to be having that conversation on a larger scale you know to where we yeah. can all get behind it you know and that's that's what it'll take I do believe that man and yeah. you know the U S is. Everybody looks at us and what we're doing. I mean, that's what democracy is yeah. all about. Everybody wants democracy, and 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 you know we're the ones that they look at. And if they see us having problems, that stands out. And then you know there's a there's a lot of things that have happened in this past year that I think has brought the world so much closer together. You know, the the pandemic as a whole. I mean, look at what's happening in India right now. I mean. Those they India is what we were six months ago, right now, but they don't have the infrastructure to mm-hmm. handle it even like we had, and we were in trouble. They are going yeah. to be losing so many people um, if they yeah. can't get that thing together. But that's where we have to we have to rally together as a, as as humanity to get together and. And let that kick in, and that—that's at the end of the end of the day, that's what wins anyway, you know. And so, yeah, we we've got some trying times, I'm sure, ahead of us. We always will have that, but I think that we we we've there's been some well, some key marks that have been hit this year. I mean, everybody on this conversation knows this. This is something I repeat to myself all the time, but I I I preach it to to the kids, which is, um. You know, my best learnings in life come from failures. Like that, that, that stuff that went well for me and I aced it. Nah, I, I didn't really learn much. Right. But you know, this is an opportunity from failure, and I and I feel like that sometimes is our best teacher. It's it just sucks that it has to be at some cost. You know that uh, you can't that is irreversible. But right. but yeah, the optimist in me says let's take this, and I, I think people are more willing to to learn because of these bad situations that have happened yeah 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 and i think it's i, I you know it's important and, and people are getting it now i know you're repetitive i think people are getting what what you know what you said jay is that that's what wins mm-hmm. right it's just it's just collective thing wins i listen to to uh to uh neil deGrasse tyson a lot. I'm oh yeah, absolutely. It. Yes. He's just, just, you know, I mean, he is what he is. He's like, you know, he's the he's the go-to astrophysicist. He's a celebrity astrophysicist. Of which, I mean, there, there are a lot of astrophysicists, but he's the right. He's the celebrity guy we got now. Like there are a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of Dr. Fauci's, but Dr. Fauci yeah. is the guy who's on right. Uh, but I will say, he is a guy who understands. Obviously, one understands his his field. But also understands how it relates to to everything else in life, mm-hmm. right? It, 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 down to our humanity, right. you know, and can explain it so simple, or so simply that it's it's, it's easy, it's, it's easily digested, and that's why I love listening to him. And his, you know, his boiling down of the universe and and, and our the, the lack of our differences is that. There are four com- most most common elements in the universe, and there's four of them, right? It's hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and and carbon, and those are found 
everywhere. There's the most common everywhere on Earth and everywhere in the universe. Right. So not only are we, not only are, is the universe within us, but we are in the universe. So we're all connected. Right. And that's the truth, right? That's Absolutely. Just, that's, those are facts. This is my idea. Right. <laughs> you know, this is, you know, being, being totally optimistic and saying, you know, I think we should all be, you know, just get along, man. No, we are. Right. Yeah. It's in our nature. Yeah. Yeah. I look. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, uh, I always enjoy him coming. I, I, I watch Bill Maher and he comes on Bill Maher quite a bit. And, yes. um, yes. that's always an interesting conversation between he and Bill. Um, but I, I love, yes. I love listening to him, man. Such a. Two of the smartest people in our, in our current time. I believe. Yeah. Those two of the smartest people. Um, you yeah. know, you like big trucks? I have a big truck. You have Speaking a big truck? of odd segues. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second. You have a... Yeah, but you don't mean like you have a monster truck. You have a truck. You just have a... Yeah. Me? No, no, no. I, I, don't, I don't have one now. I have... Hang on a second. Can you see that? Oh, there it is. Oh, that's oh, a... Oh, man. Is that, that a Bronco? Bronco? Yeah, that's me in 1982 when I was in flight. I'll okay. be darned, man. Do nice. you still have it? No, I, I got rid of it. Just gas guzzling. I took it to Germany. I'll though. be darned. Oh, I'm sure they loved you over there in that thing, man. <laughs> it has Southern comfort. Right oh, across the back. Perfect. oh, that's perfect. That's yeah. awesome. Well, the reason why I asked that, man, is like, but don't you just find that the, the trucks are just way too oversized these days? Yeah. 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 We. Like yeah, and and we. We have found what's going on, and it, it, this is one of those, I hate to tell you, told you so moments. Can, can, can I have that, Keith, real quick? Oh, you mean Bert? I hate to say I told you so. There, there you go. go. Um, <laughs> Sm- Smokey and the Bandit, man. Love that movie. Anyway, I th- was that from Smokey and the Bandit or was that it, Gator? Yes, no, that was Smokey and the Bandit. Smokey and the Bandit, okay. Gator was filmed, by the way. Portions of that was filmed down in Beaufort, Marlin. I don't know if you knew that or not. And my uncle was chief of police of Port Royal at the time. Looks just like okay. Burt Reynolds. He got mistaken for him the entire time they were they were shooting the film there. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, but any anyway, um, big trucks. Big. Where are big you going trucks. with this big trucks thing? I'm going with this. Yeah. So we we um, but you remember like the the small like um, uh, like the Chevy loves. Um, yeah. the, the little pickup, the compact trucks, well, they just kind of disappeared, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, yeah. then we had Ford Ranger made a comeback, and it was kind of a compact truck, and then it kind of disappeared too. But now you look at a new Ford Ranger, and it's it's bigger than what it was. So it's in a new class. So uh, I don't know if you knew this or not, but now Hyundai has released uh, or revealed their new pickup truck. Do you believe that? Hyundai. So Hyundai is, uh, they just released the, uh, the revealed the Santa Cruz. And basically, it's, look, it's see, a look uni- at his, look at his, look at, I'm looking at his, this is the same exact response I had. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Go, so, yeah. so it's a, it's a unibody. It's basically built on the uh, Tucson platform. So, and it, it's an SUV with a bed, is all remember it is. So the it's Subaru a Brat? Truck. Remember the, the like late 70s, early 80s Subaru Brat? Okay, yeah. so so think that kind of size, right? Yeah. Like probably smaller than an El Camino. There's rumors that Ford is going to do. This is crazy, but there's some there's some fact behind this. The Maverick is about to return as a compact truck. Yeah. See, yeah. look, same same response. See? Yeah. See, yeah. 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 So, <laughs> right. So the Ford Maverick, as we all knew, was a car. So this is about to become a, a segment. It's about think. to become yeah. a yeah. Yeah, so I, I learned to drive. I learned to drive a car in my mother's dark green. Uh, oh my Maverick. gosh! Yeah, standard shift on the yeah. on the gear shift. Three on the, on the tree, I, man. I yeah. took my driver's test yeah. in a Maverick. It was gold. It was a four door. It did not have power brakes, so it was like, you know, just. Oh yeah, All stand could, on it. Yeah, to hold to stand on the brakes. Yeah. But no. Maverick is an SUV. But it'll be a truck. It'll be yeah. a compact truck. Ford's set to re- reveal it soon. We'll keep you in the loop. I said, why are you rebooting head of the class? 
Because <laughs> we're out of we're creatively out of ideas. We're out of ideas. Yeah. Paula Paula Poundstone said this once. You know Paula Poundstone, the comedian. Yeah, yeah. She 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 always asked. She says always ask kids. You know why people are asking kids what do they want to be when they grow up? Because we're running out of ideas. <laughs> you know. So that that's it. So yeah, it's it's um I. I I brought us into this because I didn't know if you were a, a, a truck owner or not. Or do you see a lot of big, huge trucks running around where you live? Yeah. And and what for what purpose? You know, compensation. Yeah, it is. It is yes. the new. It is the new sports car. I mean, the the, the fake cow testicles hanging from the. Yeah. You know, I mean, what what. Have you seen the Have you seen the the the, um, the the extra lift kit on the on the Mercedes G wagon? Yes. No, I haven't. It's it's standard G wagon as if that's not great enough, right? You put a four six inch lift kit on it <laughs> with you know with twelve inch whatever on it, and it's like, dude, what? Why? Right. why? Here, hang you on can... one second. I just got. I got handed some homework, but I have an opportunity here. Come here. Now, he won't be able to hear you guys, but have you seen the G... He, lo- he loves G-Wagons. <laughs> have you seen the G-Wagon with the lift kit on it? I have not. Do you think that'd be cool? Probably. There you go. That's an 11-year-old. <laughs> That's why they're That's doing why. it, man. That's why. <laughs> That's there you why. go. <laughs> That's fantastic. So yeah, I have seen a lot of them out here, which is just weird because it, you're, you're yeah, here. It's, it's just it's out of place. Um, the the, the um, I, I blame I blame a lot of stuff on the, <laughs> I blame a lot of stuff. On the, the 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 ideology of the gen, of this generation. It's not it's not just this generation. It's the generation after us and the generation mm-hmm. after that. You don't have an identity, right? They didn't have a thing to identify them. It's like we had, what we have to stand on is, we went through the civil rights movement, we went through the, the anti-Vietnam movement, we went through the gay rights movement, the women's rights movement. You know, we went through the the rock revolution, right? The the the, the acceleration of industrialization after we landed on the moon. We had a lot of stuff that we could call ours. They don't have any of that, right? <laughs> you know what right. I mean? So they're trying to find a thing so they can go, yeah. So it's like, I'm the generation that bought the $100,000 car and put the eight inch lift right. kit on it. That's what we. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can have yeah. yeah. It's a, <laughs> it's an interesting thing to see. And it just seems like they won't stop with, you know, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's, but it's a, it's a viable market. And, you know, it's something that Keith and I were very aware of. That's a huge when market. We were at no, SEMA, no pun intended. Yeah. SEMA back in 2019. And, um, the SEMA show was nothing but that stuff, lift oh, kits and yeah. off-roading and all that. And that's, and they're just yeah, selling yeah. this stuff like it's candy, man. And they are getting top dollar for this stuff. It's a, it's a big deal, you know, upgrading. What is that truck? I don't remember. I don't remember when it came out, and I haven't seen one lately. But it looked. I mean, you guys will know. This is. I think I first saw it maybe four, five, six years ago. It's the. It's the. Regular consumer truck, but it looks like uh, a semi. Ah, That's I know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, we used to see a lot of the like uh, Titans football players and stuff with them that were all tricked. Yeah. Out. W- yeah. Uh, uh, what was his name? Um, Haynesworth. Yep. yep. The, had one. the yep. Uh, defensive lineman had one. It was an F700. Yep. Truck, and yep. it's absurd. It's just, I mean, it's just. I saw that guy driving that thing, man. On Albert Hainsworth was who it was. He That's was right. a, he was he graduated from University of Tennessee. He was a, he was just an awesome lineman, defensive lineman. Um, but everything big, man. He had everything big, and I saw him driving that thing down a two lane highway, and it's it's Old Hickory Boulevard between uh, Brentwood, Tennessee, and uh, Bellevue. And Keith knows that road very well. It is so small. I mean, this guy was like he should have had a wide load sticker on the front of it. <laughs> You know, so people would get out of the way because right. I mean, it was it was literally the size of a yeah. semi truck, um, and they still make those. I mean, they're still they're they sell a heck out of them, man. I yeah, they do. Yeah. People, What's the purpose of that truck? See, that's, yeah. for me, that's a thing. That's a novelty thing. It's like, 
hauler just, yeah just just what, a hauler because yeah. you know like cattle hauler or horse hauler or or equipment hauler or they um, will they will do what's called a uh, super c they will build it into an rv body yep. and that's your front end because it can pull a, a big heavy rv right so a lot of your race teams will use yep. those yeah you like you'll see a lot of them in nascar and, yeah. or, or indy the indy yep. racing yep. league which, by the way, Keith, we should have been at the Indy race in St. Petersburg this past weekend. We got to, wow. we got to, hey, we need, hey, audience, please support us because we need to get to these races. Was you it? know? So, what's, what's that? that? Sorry. Uh, there was an Indy car race down in okay. uh, uh, St. Petersburg this past Yeah, uh, you know, total, 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 it's Florida, man. I mean, Road what course, could possibly man. go wrong with, you know, Good racing in Florida and, yeah. <laughs> so back to the trucks. I was also going to add this as well, which is, um, have you heard of Breland? No. Okay. You got to go check okay. Breland out. Um, he had a big hit that came out at the beginning of the pandemic called Don't Touch My Truck. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Oh, it's, and it's he's w- wildly talented. He is extremely talented. He just knocked Bob Seeger off of his like a rock pedestal and is now the chevrolet no. song he now yeah yes. they signed no. a deal with him yeah he's so check it out it's breland don't touch my truck yes yeah they we, filmed uh they filmed gm filmed a lot of their commercial segments here at the nashville the old nashville speedway with him kind of like in a music video style for their promotional stuff but it's Here's the thing with this. I'm going to call him a kid because he's. I think he's in his 20s. Um, he he wrote this as kind of a dare. It's a it's a trap country song. Uh, it's not his genre, but he kind of just to prove that he could do it. He followed a formula and he, he did it. And, he nailed it. Yeah, and he nailed it. And that's talent. And and he's he's widely uh respected in the music industry because they will bring him in to give that little extra something to somebody that needs to break it open you know and yeah so yeah it's he we'll send you the link to it he's he will be um probably the next force to be reckoned with musically what are you doing jay you texting it to him right now yeah, I'm gonna send it to him right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like replacing Mr. Whipple. Uh, it's, <laughs> yeah. he, now, now I will say this: it's an acquired taste. So here's the thing, and I told this okay. to Jay the first time that I sent it to him, and I went, "Just give it a chance. <laughs> it's uh, it's gonna be unsettling. You're gonna be like, what is this? You will find yourself humming it and singing it okay. like okay. you know." For that's days. A, yeah, that's, yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. That's a big deal because Bob Seger is one of my yeah. top five. Well, yeah, it, oh. it's it's oh. not. This is very different. Yeah. But he there's talent in his ability to write a hook, among other yeah. things. Bob Seger, man, he's the reason why I wanted to be a rock star. And the album, the album that that really did it for me was Live Bullet yeah. from 19. Yeah. I mean, with Turn to Page and Jody Girl and all those great, I mean, one of the, the best rock classic albums ever, live albums ever. And uh, he actually just remastered that on vinyl. It's available again yeah. on vinyl. Yeah. That just was, he announced it like last week. Yeah. So it's hard to believe, man. But that was the album that really put me over the top. I mean, I was already into like, um, you know, Sabbath and, um, you know, Led Zeppelin and the Beatles. I loved all that stuff. But. You know, you heard all that stuff on the radio. Bob Seger was a hard-working dude, man, on stage, you know, and just put on the performance of his life every single time you saw him in concert, man. So Love that. Love Bob like, Seger. Can I listen to this now? Can I see this? Yeah, I guess you can. I, yeah, yeah, get, sure. get a reaction video. This is We'll go out this is, on this. We'll go out on this, Marlon's yeah. reaction. Okay, let's, let, let's let him go take ahead. it in here. Go right. ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh. 
So is this real, the black kid? Yeah, yeah. He's a... So there you go, man. Now, let it. That's why we're selling trucks. Give it, but I'm telling you, give it 24 hours and then it's And you're going to you're going to come oh back my to gosh, it. Oh that's funny. Right that on. GM signed. That is their uh, he's he's doing their promotional uh, stuff now. Yeah. So good, good for, for him. Good look, man. You know, good for him. I just it it feels he, it feels you're just trying too hard. Blasphemous, <laughs> yeah. Well, he he wrote a trap. He wrote a country trap. It's trap. It's, it's, yeah. it's a it's a it's a genre. It's called trap country, man. It is it is out of Nashville. That's what they're doing. He lives in Atlanta now. Um, great songwriter. Yeah, yeah. Great songwriter. Okay. So, I, I, yeah. Well, I I was just gonna you know I, what? Hey, there you go. Now you're. You're welcome. Now you, you've been now, introduced yeah. to yeah. <laughs> now you know, man. Can't thank you enough today for for being oh, on man, with I us, Marlon. This is great. It's always the yeah. last time. This time was even better. Really. Well, we will we will definitely make sure that we we get your schedule back on. We know you're busy trying to sell your house and you got a lot of projects going on, but we will definitely do that again. And you reach out to us anytime you want to, man. You're you're welcome on our show anytime. Thank you, man. Thank, thank you okay, so much. Thank, thank you both of you. So, uh, the next time I do it, we'll, we'll we'll probably be broadcasting from Italy. <laughs> uh, that yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that'll be fine. That'd be fun. You'll be our first. Well, no, you'll be our second international guest. Who's first? Because we had uh, my good friend. Uh, well, the band Racelon out of uh, Santa Catarina, Brazil. Uh, the lead vocalist is a good friend of mine from the I automotive see, industry. I see you has that name a lot on you. Yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah. Yeah, there are uh, – oh, we can't – I can't. I'm not allowed to – I'll tell you I'll tell you after we stop recording. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I almost let something out of the bag there. Oh, yeah, you can't do that, man. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't do All that. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll tell you here in a second, though. But uh, anyway, thanks for coming on, everybody. Thanks for listening today. Um, uh, Marlon Chopper Young. Check him out on Netflix. You'll see him occasionally pop up on a commercial. Um, go check out Entourage. You'll, you'll never be sorry for the Rufus character. Is that to me made my day every time you were on there. Um, but uh, give him some love next time you see him. Um, again, thank you so much for being on our show, everybody. Keith, you want to lead us out? Uh, I well, <laughs> you thought I was. You were doing such a great job of it. I uh, yeah, yeah. Here, here. I, this is this is this is in line with what we were just talking about earlier. Uh, this is this is one from uh, Winston Churchill. The pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. The optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. Ooh, Ooh. very good. There you go. Thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>